we're going to try and be kind to uh, your time today as we will have a business meeting here at 1 o'clock. So open your Bibles without further ado to 1 Peter uh, chapter 2. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 2. You may find that uh, I will do this sermon 2.0 next Sunday if I don't feel <laughs> that I adequately presented it today. Uh, but uh, just want to be mindful of the time. And it is interesting, though, the, the title that Pastor and I talked about and that he told the church about this morning, uh, Who Holds the Reins of Your Brains? I got to thinking about that. And if, if ever we wanted to be certain at a time when God is holding the reins of our brains, it's when we're going through difficulty. Should be all the time, but trials and tribulation and certainly what the people in First Peter are facing, they need to be certain that God is controlling their thoughts. And so I want to present to you this afternoon uh, how to maybe some guidelines, if you will, to help us present acceptable sacrifices to God. And the reason I use that term is because we see that very phrase pop up in First Peter chapter 2 in verse 5. So let's just uh, read and we'll read a, a few verses in First Peter chapter 2 uh, and then we'll, we'll review a little bit of what we looked at so far. So First Peter chapter 2 verse 1, we talked about this last week. It says, wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offenses, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. And then verse 9, But ye are a chosen generation." a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So that, that there's a lot in this part. In fact, I couldn't even title it. I didn't know how to title uh, the sermon today just because there's a lot in here. And actually, Peter, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is using uh, some some references from the Old Testament. So we're going to look at some of those uh, in just a moment. But as we've already studied in the book, as is stated in chapter 1, verse 3, we have been begotten again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So followers of Jesus Christ should be filled with hope as we live the life that he's called us to. We should be filled with hope. Amen. In fact, uh, to live the Christian life, without hope should seem like an oxymoron, right? It just doesn't fit together, doesn't flow together. Followers of Christ should live their lives with hope, but we understand that it doesn't just happen automatically. You know, in suffering, our tendency is not to look inward at what our response should be, but our tendency when something's not going the way we want it to go is to look outside of us to see what's causing the problem, right? Who could be making me feel this way and what do I need to do to change it? And we're in danger of doing exactly what we're warned against in chapter 2, verse 1. So that's why Peter says, therefore, or wherefore, lay aside all malice. Lay it aside. Don't be tempted to go there. All guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings because the flesh will land there. So put those aside. Lay those aside. So those responses are, are completely opposite of what Peter said we should do in trials earlier in chapter 1. Uh, chapter 1, verse 6, wherein ye greatly rejoice. That's what doesn't seem to come so naturally, right? Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, he says, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory 
at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Well, if we're going to grow to the point of greatly rejoicing, not just rejoicing, it says greatly rejoicing in trials, then we're going to have to continue our study in 1 Peter, aren't we? Because uh, the Lord is so gracious and giving us what we need to live the life he's called us to live. He's given us what we need to live uh, rejoicing. I think that's sort of what Pastor was saying at the end. I, he wished he could convey to us how wonderful studying this book truly is. And if you study it on a regular basis, I think you know exactly what he means. It just seems that there's more there, and, and God is just waiting for you to invest the time and the energy and the, and the heart into what he has so he can reveal it to you. And it's a wonderful thing to experience, and it causes us and helps us greatly rejoice even when we're in difficult situations. So today in 1 Peter chapter 2, Part of the hope that that's how I've sort of themed every sermon from this book that we've gone through so far. Part of the hope of this passage has come from several Old Testament references. So as I was reading in chapter two, did you hear a lot of stone references? Living stone, lively stone, cornerstone, and some some stone related words such as rock and other things that is uh, that that comes about uh, quite a bit as we read through there. So. I want you to notice verse 5 again, because this is how, uh, if I'm going to title it, I would title it along these lines. Verse 5 says, Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So what are some guidelines to help us offer up acceptable sacrifices? sacrifices to God. What are some guidelines? Well, first of all, we need to recognize that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. He is the cornerstone. I love the analogy of building here because it's actually just quite simple. How many of you who are in the industry of of, uh, building, would you say you could build a house successfully without a foundation, without a, a starting point, without something for the house to be built on? It simply doesn't happen. So I I hope you noticed all that that stone language. It's there uh, in in many different places. So the first thing to note in understanding the cornerstone and stone imagery is that it is referring to a person. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. And we see that in in verse 6 makes mention of uh, a passage that we're going to look at in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 28. I didn't get these verses to Harvey before service, so if you don't see them on the screen, you may have to turn there. But I like this sound anyway, don't you? When everybody's doing the turning of the silks. So turn to Isaiah chapter 28. <clears throat> While you're turning there, I'm going to read verse 6 of chapter 2 in First Peter and see if you can see the similarities. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, Elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Isaiah chapter 28 now in verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure stone, a foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Now, I can easily beef that up a bit uh, with other passages in scripture. One you're probably familiar with in Acts chapter 4. Uh, If I said Acts chapter 4, verse 12, uh, you may know. But Acts chapter 4, verse 10 through 12, uh, this you can turn there as well. This records Peter's words spoken to the Jewish priests and Sadducees after Peter and John had healed the laden man uh, in Acts chapter 3. And Peter clearly identifies Jesus as the cornerstone. I'm just giving you some some meat here so you can understand this is referring to a person. It's quite clear in 1 Peter. Isaiah it, we know, but he doesn't save specifically. So I just want to give you a couple of verses that does say Acts chapter four and verse 10. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. This is the stone. There it is. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And we know from the Gospels that Peter would have received that information from Jesus himself, who applied the stone, the cornerstone imagery, directly to himself in a couple other places. In Mark chapter 12, shortly before Jesus' arrest and crucifixion, 
he tells the parable to the chief priests and scribes to the effect that they, the Jewish leaders, essentially, are fulfilling the scriptures about rejecting the cornerstone, which is, you know, first of all, we understand you need a cornerstone to build a building, and it's the religious leaders who are rejecting that cornerstone. Mark chapter 12 and verse 10. And have you not read the scriptures? This is Jesus talking to them. The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. This was the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. Did they not know that? Verse 12. And they sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them, and they left him and went their way. Do you not love those kind of interactions in scripture? where Jesus just leaves them literally with nothing to say and nothing to do because they are fearful. Boy, if they, if they had just realized the wonderful relationship they could have had to the living Christ right there, right then. But this is not what they did. So Jesus Christ, he is the cornerstone. And as the cornerstone, he's the most important stone in the building, which according to verse 5 back in our text in 1 Peter chapter 2, is a spiritual house. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house house. So we'll get into the, the imagery there uh, in just a moment. So I said another way to think of Jesus as a cornerstone is to see him as a foundation. As I said, you can't really have a, a building without a foundation. But that does make what we read in verse 7 of 1 Peter chapter 2 a bit more scandalous because the stone, which any good builder would know is needed, they disallowed, they rejected. The same is made the head of the corner, it said. The builders are supposed to know, they're supposed to be the ones that know what they're doing, and yet they reject the most important stone that there is for the building. They reject Jesus Christ. And that's what makes these Old Testament references, I believe, so significant. Rejection from and exaltation from God were both prophesied. This this is stuff we've, we've read in the Old Testament, the rejection of the Son of God, who is chosen and precious, the cornerstone uh, that God picked is, is shocking enough that they would reject that. But then the fact that it was prophesied, I don't know that anybody would have believed it if it wasn't have, had been prophesied before. But to turn back and see that, to see that this was, was prophesied, the builders that rejected him, and of course the fact that they were none other than the religious leaders of the very nation that prided themselves on being the people of God, of being God's chosen nation, the holy nation, a kingdom of priests. Uh, so I, I hope you catch what, what I'm trying to say there. Just scandalous was that, that Jesus plainly told his disciples that this was going to happen, and even they struggled with it. Remember, in Mark chapter 9, you, if you're close to that, you can look, Mark chapter 9 and verse 31, Jesus is telling his disciples what's going to happen, and, and, and they don't quite get it. For he taught his disciples, verse 31 of Mark chapter 9, and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. They were afraid to ask. Chapter 8, one one chapter back of Mark chapter 8, the disciples, the confusion only is made more bewildering when we understand that this came after he'd already been teaching them about what was going to happen. Verse 31 of chapter 8, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly. And who is the one that's going to speak up and take issue with it? But the very one who's, who's writing, the Spirit is using to write what we're studying in First Peter. Peter took him and rebuked him. Not so, remember? Even with the Old Testament prophecy and with the clear, plain teaching of Jesus, the thought that the chief cornerstone, the longed-for Messiah, the one who would come, that, that he would be rejected and then be killed is unthinkable to them. And yet, that's exactly what happens. But, of course, we know that, that that's not the end of it. There's good news that Jesus, of course, raises from the dead. And, uh, and he is the chief cornerstone. That's why he refers to him, though, as a living stone, because he's not dead any longer, right? He rose again, and that's what we celebrate in our faith, and, and uh, it, it's so important. Another guideline for offering acceptable sacrifices to God, which we're going to get to in verse 5. Number one, recognize God, a Christ, as a chief cornerstone. <laughs> I did. God is, is acceptable as well. But also, we ought to go to Jesus so that he can use us 
in his, cons- his, redip- his redemptive plan for man. We ought to go to Jesus. Let's read it again so we can see that in verse 4. In 1 Peter chapter 2. Sorry, I'm in so many places. Perhaps you don't know that. We're back, we're back there now. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, it's talking to us, as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Peter not only quotes the Old Testament, but he alludes to it in many ways as well. Hold your finger here now and turn to Psalms chapter 34, a very beloved psalm uh, in the book of Psalms, Psalms number 34. While you're, tur- while you're turning there, I'll read verse 3 to you of 1 Peter chapter 2. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Psalms chapter 34 and verse 8, probably one of the most well-known verses in that in the book of Psalms, says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Now, it seems that to clearly show that Peter is referring to Psalms chapter 34 as he's writing this letter, but we, we, we don't ga- gather that just from that reference to taste and see that the Lord is gracious. He actually, he actually quotes it to some length uh, in chapter 3, and there's strong reason to believe that Peter is purposefully thinking about Psalms 34 here. And as I, I found this reference and I began to study it, I thought, why is this so significant? And this is the type of, type of thing that I wish you just sometimes have to experience for yourself in studying God's word. You know, when you study and God just gives you a sweet truth and, and you try to communicate it with somebody and they're just like, that's great. Yeah. And, and you don't know if they're genuinely accepting it. They're happy for you, but you just haven't felt like you've conveyed to them what God has shown you. And it's like monumental in your mind. And other people are like, oh, that's great. You know, so this is kind of that thing for me. But one of the things we see in Psalms chapter 34, Peter's statement in verse 4 of chapter 2 in 1 Peter, whom coming, that being Jesus, that Jesus is the Lord of verse 3. And if verse 3 is quoting Psalms 34, then the Lord he referenced in Psalms 34 is none other than the God of heaven and earth in the Old Testament. So the point is, Jesus isn't just chosen and precious uh, by God, but he is none other than God in the flesh. This is a deity thing. This is the God that they are re- that he's referring to, the Son of God, the second member of the Trinity. And I know it gets a bit complicated, but to me, it's very valuable doctrinal information. We, we have to understand that Jesus, the chief cornerstone, is God. This is the deity of Christ. Therefore, if you want to go to God, the only way to come to him is, the living is through the living stone, Jesus Christ. And of course, they're one and the same in the Trinity. So it's a key application when you really understand Jesus is God and he is the cornerstone that the Father sees as chosen and precious. We need to point people to Jesus Christ. What do you mean by that, Pastor Tricky? Have you ever noticed that there is a big population of people in our culture that are okay to talk about God? You know, they'll say something like, God bless you, or you're in my thoughts or prayers, or uh, God is good. But have you noticed it gets a little less comfortable when you introduce Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. When you begin to say something along the lines of Jesus Christ, the Son of God? It's interesting that that's challenging for some people to take. Why is that? Why is that? Why is that? Why do people seem to be uncomfortable when we when we start talking beyond God and start talking about his son, Jesus Christ. Well, to me, this passage helps us understand why Jesus is so important. Because if you want to get to God, there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved than Jesus Christ. So we must speak, we must draw people to Jesus. And I hope you can see the themes here in our passage. Those who go to Jesus, the living stone, are going to be built up into a spiritual house. And as verse 7 indicates, there's real value and honor for those who believe. Notice if you come to Jesus, the living stone, what happens? Jesus makes you, as individuals then, a lively stone as well. Ye also, as lively stones, as the redeemed, as the saved, are built up a spiritual house. Hmm, What could that spiritual house be that he's referring to? And holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God 
by Jesus Christ. Jesus is the living stone. That's precious, chosen by God. He's been resurrected. And so those who come to him, they get the life, resur- they get the life and the resurrection from Jesus and are made into living stones. Before we get to what we are built into, I want you to see this, the connection between the identity and experience of Jesus and the identity and experience of his people. In fact, I'm not going to spend too much time doing it because that's what I've done uh, in speaking on 1 Peter chapter 1 and what we talked about in chapter 2 last week. The, the, there's, there's a connection, right? If we are the children of God, these living stones then we also experience much of the same things that Jesus, the living stone, experienced. Rejection of men and and sufferings and difficulties and persecutions. Peter's writing to people who were suffering, majorly suffering. They were displaced. They had to leave everything they owned and run for their lives. And some of them indeed did die. This truth and that, that their identity and experience should actually match the identity and experience of Jesus Christ was incredibly hopeful for them. I mean, can you imagine as a believer knowing that what you're suffering is what Jesus suffered and you can identify with that? There's great hope there. There's great hope that's being presented to them. It's hopeful to them and it's hopeful to us as well. This suffering and rejection that they're going through isn't evidence that God is against them. It's evidence that they belong to Jesus Christ and they too are living stones. So we should not, we should not uh, think it strange when we have these trials and difficulties. Some of you caught perhaps what I did there because there's a verse that says that very thing in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12, a couple chapters forward. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but you too are a living stone. And this is going, you, you're going to experience uh, the identity in, in, in Christ's identity, some of the same things. So uh, it helps us uh, to understand that. The author of Hebrews said it this way, Wherefore Jesus also, that he may sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. You ever wake up feeling that way? <laughs> we have no continuing city here, but we seek one to come. We seek one to come. I think according to Peter, the animosity and hate that's growing towards genuine Bible believers and followers of Christ isn't evidence of anything strange. It's not strange. It's not odd. It's what we should expect as living stones. We should expect to to see that animosity to increase. And it has. It has. That's what I mean. It's okay to talk about God, but if you're going to introduce Jesus Christ through the conversation... Uh, the the attitude quickly changes. We were at a College Royal yesterday, which is a, a big open house that they put on at Guelph University, and it's really it's fascinating. And the science department puts on different things, and and they they were explaining the ear. Fascinating. The you ever you heard of the cochlear in the ear? They got all these little tiny hairs, and all those tiny little hairs interpret different wavelengths of sound and it vibrates in your ear telling you what the tone is it just baffled my mind and kyla kyla the weedricks were there kyla said something along the lines of wow isn't it how can you say that that's not god and the scientist was just like you know (laughs) like he didn't know what to say like he just didn't anticipate that but folks the world it's just it's just as we learned this morning in the morning service the world is controlled by the devil And they want to control our minds. But if we will just look to the heavens that they declare the glory of God, that God is the creator of all this. How could what is what is man to that? Who are we that God would would select us and choose us as his as his precious people? We, too, are chosen and precious in God's sight. And as Peter says multiple times in our text in first Peter, chapter two, verse six, and he who believeth on him shall not be confounded. Verse 7, unto you, therefore, who believes he is precious. Verse 6, or excuse me, chapter 5 and verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. This is a life that is going to be filled with trial and with rejection. But for those that wait on the Lord and look to him for their salvation, our eager hope and expectation is that we will be exalted by the Lord at the right time. In due season... If we humble ourselves before him. 
Now, we really haven't gotten into what is being built by that cornerstone and the other living stones. And I believe he is referring, of course, uh, to the church. So the spiritual house, the church. In, in the Bible, when you see the word temple uh, in the Old Testament, clearly uh, it's referring to a place. But it's easy to grasp that the temple, although it was a physical building, was a place where God wanted to dwell with his people. Right. So that's why we have all, all the, the temple, the plate ever since the Garden of Eden, when God was able to communicate with man before sin. That's what God desires. And so we see the temple being built. David wanted to make a house for God, a place where God could come and dwell. But we had to have some safety nets in place because we're we're just sinners. So we're not able to be exposed to the holiness of God. Thus the walls around the temple, thus the curtain, thus the high priest and all of the 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 intense level of of things that had to happen for the priest to go in there. All that was there for protection of man who would just fall down dead in the presence of his holiness until Jesus Christ came and tore that veil. Until Jesus Christ came and made it possible for us to go to God and to be in his presence. And our bodies became the temple of God where God can dwell with us. That is his desire to dwell with us. The temple building was always just a representation for a time until the, tr until the true temple, Jesus Christ came. And as Peter says, he's the cornerstone of this new spiritual house, this new temple. But what's amazing is that we individually are built into this new house, into this spiritual house, as living stones. But you're just one stone, right? And by yourself, you're a pathetic house, right? You just Who builds a house with one rock? Here it is. You know, we are a part of the spiritual house, and we are all living stones, and we are to build the church of God together. Well, he builds it. We participate by being faithful and by learning. One brick and one stone isn't a house. It's impossible to make a house without loads of other bricks and loads of other stones. And I hope you see the point I'm trying to make here. You can't fulfill the purpose God has for your life if you don't see that you're just one stone uh, in, in, in many. It's important. That's, I, I always baffle myself when people uh, baffle in my mind when, when people think church is not important. You know, then how are you participating in building the house of God? How are you participating in growing together and, and being a part of, of the plan of God? If you're going to come to Jesus and be a living stone, then you must be in community with other living stones where you're allowed, a Jesus, we're allowing Jesus to shape you and build you into a spiritual house. We are in this church building, and as lovely as it is, the building project that God is focused on is the people that is sitting within it. You know, it's us. He's focused on building us together as living stones that, that will, will, will continue to share the gospel. If you understand this, then please tell me you understand how important it is and how easy it is to apply to faithful church attendance. You know, if you're a follower of Christ, you make attending church a huge priority. You want to be here. You want to, to be a part of, of what God is building. God is seeking to build a grand spiritual house where his presence dwells with his people. Of all things that could have been said about heaven when the new heaven and the new earth are finally uh, revealed and announced, this is the announcement by God himself. And listen, based on what I've just been telling you in Revelation chapter 21, in verse 3, it's easy to flip over there because it's right at the end. Unless you have hundreds of pages of other things in the back of your Bible like I do. <laughs> Revelation 21, verse 3. Listen what comes out of this announcement from God. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. Do you see the emphasis on God dwelling with his people? We get a foretaste of that now, but if you really want to dwell in the presence of God, Peter's making the point that you should really want to be dwelling with other believers as well, as living stones. When we go to Jesus and line our lives up with him, then we all as individual living stones are built into a spiritual house where the presence of God is among us. Now, understand that church attendance is not required for salvation. I'm not saying that, uh, but it sure should be a side effect of your salvation. 
And if you don't feel that way, then just study the Bible a bit more. You're not studying very well because the church is the purpose why we're here. We're here in the church age to go forward and to present the gospel of Christ. And he has chosen the church to do that. And it doesn't take very long in studying the scripture to see that that's the case. And finally, this afternoon, another way to offer a guideline for offering acceptable sacrifices unto God. We talked about recognizing Jesus as chief cornerstone going to him and being a part of his redemptive plan of construction for the spiritual house, and then live out your purpose in Christ. Verse 9 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. There is so I could go through each of those terms in, in, in uh, the unrevised version of this sermon. I do go through those. Uh, but for sake of time, I'm not going to. Just, just to mention... A priesthood. Obviously, we know that God's people, the chosen people of Israel, were to be his representatives on earth. They didn't do a great job at that. So here we are now. We also are a royal priesthood. We're here now to represent uh, Christ and to draw people. We're a chosen generation, a holy nation, and a peculiar people. Notice that we're to be different. We're to look different. We're to act different. And, and this passage really has outreach and, and, and missions written all over it. <clears throat> holy, we're a holy nation, means set apart. The church is supposed to be different. We're supposed to speak, act, and think in such a way that is clear that we're different from the rest of the world. The church isn't supposed to fit in. You know, the way we live, uh, looking to Christ and rejoicing in trials should be very attractive to people that it will draw others to, to, to follow the Lord. We're peculiar people, a treasured people. Pastor mentioned, I think, the verse this morning uh, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, where Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And we see that sacrifice acceptable to God. So how do we do that? The guidelines, you present your body a living sacrifice. And I think it's important always to note that's just a reasonable service, according to that verse. It's reasonable. In fact, we should, should, should be so thankful and so grateful all the time uh, for what God has done for us. Verse 9 of our text, and I'll close with that. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people. And right here, the purpose, that's what I want to end with, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Have you been called out of darkness and into marvelous light? then let's show forth the praise of him who hath called us into that. Let's do that together as a church. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for this passage. And Lord, I, I don't know if I, I successfully portrayed the hope that we have here, but Lord, I find it so very hopeful uh, to know that, that we belong to you. And Lord, that we ha you have given us a purpose to, to be your light, uh, to be your representatives. And although it requires sacrifice on our part, Lord, as you, as you sacrifice things for you, you just are filled with joy. And uh, Lord, I pray you'd help us to understand that. Help us to, to know that, uh, that you're in our midst and that you lead us and direct us and you can offer us uh, the joy and fulfillment that we so seek in this life. We want to please you with everything that we say and do. Lord, would you bless our time now as we enter into a, a business meeting. Just pray that you'd bless it, uh, that you'd be honored in that. In Jesus' name, amen. What do you think about